and welcome to Grand Rounds for May 2022. So today we have uh, Dr. Jessica Hamadi Atia and Dr. Isabella uh, Scangamore. Correct? No, Scangamore. Scangamore. My apologies. Uh, presenting to us today um, about cupping and also about dance medicine. So it's a two-part uh, Grand Rounds today. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Hamadi Atia will be uh, talking uh, talking to us about cupping. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree and subsequently her Doctor of Physical Therapy from Lebanon Valley College. She's currently co-chief resident at St. Luke's University Health Network's Orthopedic Physical Therapy Residency. And she was initially introduced to cupping during her clinical rotations while in school. After graduating and starting clinical practice, she's been able to develop significant exp expertise in the use of dry cupping to help manage various orthopedic conditions in many of her patients. Dr. Skangamore, earned her Bachelor of Science degree from Muhlenberg College in Dance Science and a Doctor of Physical Therapy from Thomas Jefferson University. She's currently co-chief resident in uh, St. Luke's University Health Network's Orthopedic Physical Therapy Residency. And while in school, she was able to complete her final clinical rotations uh, while at at Harkness Center for Dance Injuries. Additionally, she regularly offers injury prevention workshops to local dance programs and has assisted in the formation of the Performing Arts Medicine in Initiative at St. Luke's University Health Network. So I am now going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Hamadi Atia, who will uh, begin the first part of this. All right, you enjoy your way back into the And please make sure that you mute yourself. Uh, hello, everyone. So this is our statement of need and targeted to all providers. This is our designation statement that we have nothing to disclose. And these are our learning objectives, both for my presentation and Isabella's. So I always want to thank everyone for attending this Grand Rounds presentation. Uh, as Steve said, my name is Jessica Hamadi Atia, and I will be discussing cupping therapy, uh, its uses, benefits, and more. So I'm using this term cupping therapy, but what is it? So there are a few different types. There's dry cupping and there's wet cupping. So dry cupping uses a negative pressure created through suction, whether that's manual, fire, or electric. Typically in a clinical setting, uh, manual suction is used. However, it's not uncommon to see fire cupping outside of the clinical setting. And then wet cupping uses a scarification or puncture to the skin and suctions to draw the toxic blood to the surface, as you can see in the picture on the left. Um, the mechanism of action of cupping is not well understood. Uh, there have been six mechanisms suggested in the literature, and there are three specific biological and mechanical bases of pain, uh, which include the gate control theory, conditional pain modulation, and reflex zone theory. So gate control theory uh, describes how a non-painful uh, sensation can override and reduce painful sensations. So a painful nociceptive stimulus can stimulate a primary afferent fiber and travel to the brain via transmission cells. So this increases activity of the transmission cell, resulting in increased perceived pain. So cupping therapy could influence that communication of the pain transmission from the stimulated area to the brain and back. So it activates the large fibers which close the pain gate and causes pain relief. Uh, conditional pain modulation or diffuse noxious inhibitory controls or DNICs uh, this idea explains how pain inhibits pain, or a type of pain can mask another. So the activation of this pain pathway is triggered by a distant noxious stimulus, so in this case it would be cupping, which causes an inhibition of the primary pain at the level of the nociceptive spinal neurons. According to this theory, local vibrations or scratching done during cupping therapy causes a nociceptive stimulus that triggers the activation of the DNICs, which eventually leads to the relief of the primary pain. And lastly, the reflex zone theory proposes that there is an existing link between one organ of the body and another. This link is mediated by interactions between nerves, chemicals, and muscles. So a disturbance in one organ can cause an external manifestation, which can be detected as a site distal to the disturbed organ. For example, uh, skin can become cold or pale when vasoconstriction occurs, or it can become warm and red when vasodilation occurs. So the organ's functions are affected due to the reduction in the circulating blood and tissue fluids. So in animal studies, it showed that somatic stimulation of the skin or the peripheral joints could lead to significant effects on the cardiovascular system, the urinary system, and the gastrointestinal system. So these reflexes can be either excitatory or inhibitory 
in terms of organ functions, and their main action is attained through the spinal pathways, supraspinal, and cortical centers. Um, it is hypothesized that the application of the cupping therapy over the skin results in a stimulation of the skin receptors, which will eventually lead to an improvement in the blood circulation through the neural connections to the affected organs. So the four main benefits that have been found in research are pain relief. So cupping has been shown to relieve pain, reduce scar tissue deep within the muscles and connective tissues, and decreases swelling and muscle knots. It's supposed to minimize the circulating toxins by bringing them closer to the skin where they're more easily treated and removed. It also eases inflammation. Uh, so the vacuum-like suction from the cup causes a microtrauma to the applied area, and this causes the body to release an array of chemicals, uh, fibroblasts and white blood cells to the affected area, which triggers the healing process. And as I said earlier, it also increases blood flow. Um, so it causes smooth muscle tension, which can improve overall blood flow and boost cell repair. It can also help build new connective tissues and produce new blood vessels in the tissue. Um, and in a study in 2020 done by the National Library of Medicine, cupping therapy had a great relief in fatigue symptoms, improved emotion and sleep condition. So who would you use this on? So some indications um, are healthy individuals, uh, headaches, low back pain, neck pain, knee pain, myofascial pain syndrome, osteoarthritis, even though the evidence is limited, and then pain with athletes. And then who would you not use this on? Um, some absolute contraindications to cupping therapy would be cancer, organ failure, a pacemaker, hemophilia, or similar blood disorders. It's also not recommended for geriatric patients, pediatric patients, pregnant and menstruating women, specifically for wet cupping. And then anatomically, some contraindications are DVT, open wounds, bone fractures, and not directly over nerves, arteries, veins, varicose veins, skin lesions, body orifices, lymph nodes, eyes, or skin inflammation. And those suffering from CVD who are using anticoagulants or have acute infection should avoid cupping therapy. So all this talk about cupping and who you should and shouldn't use it on, but how do you use it? So it's simple. For this example, I'll just be describing the use for a manual pump. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is the main use that I specifically use in clinic and that you'll see in clinical settings, um, but don't be, it's not unfamiliar to see other ways of using it. So the first thing you wanna do is educate your patient on it and get their consent to use it. Um, you then want to disinfect the area of interest. Uh, then you'll apply an emollient to avoid any friction of the skin in the cup. Um, you'll find a suitable cup size for the area indicated, which you'll palpate to find. Um, to apply the cup, you'll place the cup on the skin and use the manual pump to create a negative pressure. Uh, start at patient tolerance. Uh, so the more pumps equals more pressure, which inherently becomes more effective. However, some patients won't be able to tolerate it. So start at what they're able to tolerate and then slowly progress into more. Um, parameters are unknown. However, there are various studies that try to look at the most effective measures, but there's no consensus in the literature. Um, the time as well is variable. So most studies say three to five minutes is an appropriate time for static cupping. However, some studies show that five to 10 minutes could also be used. So clinically, I also determine this based this time based on patient's skin sensitivity. So if they get a lot of redness or petechiae, then I'll take the cup off sooner prior to the time being up. Um, there's also a, a few different ways that you could use the cup. So as I said earlier, you can use it statically for that three to five minutes. Um, so that's when you just place the cup on and you put it in the spot that's most indicated, or you can use a gliding or dynamic method. So you put it the cup over a large area, you'll use less pumps and kind of glide the cup over the length of the, of the tissue. There's also like an active release that you can do. So for example, if I would put a cup on someone's calf I can have them actively dorsiflex and plantar flex to get that active release of the tight muscle. And right now I'll play a video that shows the gliding method to give you guys a visual on how to use it. Sam from Pro Chiropractic. Today I wanna to show you one of the modalities that I utilize here in the office of cupping and more specifically dynamic cupping. I know a lot of times when patients think about cupping, uh, you just stick the cup on and you leave it there. That's known as static cupping. I'm going to show you just a little different variation today. So we already have some emollient on Christy's upper trap here, just kind of help with any sort of friction that we might have. Okay, so what we'll do is put about a pump, pump and a half here, just like so, in the upper trap, and then we're just going to move it along the length of the muscle like so. Okay, now you can notice the skin is gathering underneath that cup. 
We're getting some good circulation and blood flow in through there. Just like so. Okay. Now circulation and blood flow is important because it's bringing oxygen and nutrients into those tissues to help uh, jumpstart the healing process and uh, develop healthy tissue. Now if we get it on too tight there, I think we might have it just a little too tight. We can go ahead and, and do another round here. Just like so. Right. You'll notice the, the skin is getting nice and red and everything. We have circulation that goes through the skin, so sometimes uh, the, the suction of the cup can, can cause some, some redness, sometimes a little bit of bruising, uh, usually no big deal with that. Okay, and we'll just go back and forth right through there. All right. So as you guys saw in that video, he used dynamic cupping to treat that patient, and it's much less of a pump versus the static. So you'd use one or one and a half pumps and just glide it over the tissue just the way that he did it. Um, so side effects that you should educate your patient on are erythema, edema, ecchymo ecchymosis, and potential dizziness or lightheadedness. You also want to tell them that it takes between one and 10 days for the bruising to eventually go away. Um, so what does the research, research show? Uh, the, so the current evidence available indicates that cupping is effective for patients with chronic nonspecific neck pain in terms of reducing pain scores, improvement in disability scores, and quality of life compared to no treatment or active control, such as NSAIDs, a hot pack, or acupuncture. So in this study specifically, um, it included 32 participants who were split into three groups, a dry cupping group, a sham cupping group, and a control group. One stationary cup was placed over the most painful area for eight minutes. Uh, the sham cupping intervention followed the same procedure as the dry cupping. However, they used sham cups and the control had no treatment at all. Uh, the study found to reduce neck pain and increased oxygenated and total hemoglobin levels after just an eight minute session. So this showed to have very good short term benefits. However, there were a few limitations. Um, they had a very small sample size as well as no long term follow up. So it showed that there's short term benefit to this. However, in the long term, it didn't they didn't follow up, so we wouldn't know if it helped um, and in this study, it was a Kim at, Kim at all study that was conducted with a systematic review and a meta-analysis. It included 18 total studies, out of which seven were used wet cupping as the intervention and 11 used dry cupping. The number of subjects in each study ranged from 40 to 240 participants. The subjects in the cupping group were reported to have significant reduction in pain scores and significant improvement in terms of function and quality of life compared with no intervention or an active control group. Uh, and this study, which looked at musculoskeletal pain and range of motion, included 21 randomized control trials with 1,049 participants. The quality of evidence was fair, um, and participants ranged between 18 years old and 18 years old and older. This concluded that dry cupping was found to be effective for reducing pain in patients with chronic neck pain and low back pain. Um, there was moderate evidence for improved functional status for chronic neck pain. However, there was low quality of evidence for improvement in range of motion. Uh, this Wang et al. study looked at uh, individuals with low back pain. It was a meta-analysis and it used six randomized control trials. The total number of participants was 458, so 230 received cupping versus 228 who received usual care. Um, five randomized con control trials included patients with nonspecific low back pain, and a single randomized control trial included postpartum women with low back pain. Uh, there were different types of cupping that was used in these trials. So three used dry cupping, two used wet cupping, and then one used the moving cupping, which was the dynamic cupping that you saw in the video. And then pain was measured with three different tools, the visual analog scale, the Oswestry, and the McGill pain index, or a combination of the three. The meta-analysis concluded that cupping therapy was more effective compared to other modalities on reducing the visual analog scores and the ODI scores. However, the positive effect was not captured on the McGill pain index. So now I want to go into review a few patient examples of mine that had had successful outcomes with cupping. So patient A is a young male who is interested in bodybuilding and weightlifting. Uh, he was seeing another therapist for left shoulder pain with primary complaints during flat bench pressing. However, he had no pain with incline bench pressing. So he was being treated for about six weeks. He had a total of 11 sessions. And as he was getting close to dis discharge, his therapist asked if I could cup him and see if that would help at all and see if there was any change. 
So I cupped his anterior and posterior shoulder, which is where his pain mostly was. Um, and then I had him bench. So I gave him 30 pound dumbbells in both hands and he had no pain at the end of 10 reps, which was a good sign because before he did. Um, the next session that he came in, I cupped him again. Um, and he told me at that session that he was able to bench 135 for the first time in six months for 10 reps uh, with minimal pain by the end of that 10, 10 reps. So after the second session, when he came in the third time, he was able to bench 185 for two sets of eight. Um, and then at that third session, I educated the patient on how to use it because he got himself his own cupping kit. Um, and he reported that he was about 90% better after just three sessions of cupping. Uh, patient B had a quad tendon repair who came to me six weeks after the procedure for her initial evaluation with the primary goal of returning to riding her peloton and weight training. So she had limited flexion range of motion and difficulty with quad activation. Um, we slowly regained her range of motion from 60 to 90 in a matter of um, eight weeks. So we were hovering around this like 90 to 93 a degree range of motion for flexion. She continued to have this quad tightness, but stretching never really helped it. Um, so at about three and a half months post-surgery, I trialed cupping. In a matter of four sessions, she regained 15 degrees. So she went from 93 degrees to 108 degrees of flexion. Um, and her quad activation also improved significantly. And she was finally able to perform a straight leg raise. Um, and then she was able to get back on her Peloton. And then we started strengthening, which was her main goal. Uh, patient C was one of my coworkers. Uh, he went for a walk with a weighted vest, which is something that he does three or more times a week. Um, so after one of his walks, he came in with this like gnawing CTJ pain. Um, other therapists tried uh, high velocity, low amplitude thrusts and different mobilizations to help with the pain, but he never had complete resolution of his symptoms. So I offered to cup him um, and he provided his consent. So what I did was I applied cups uh, on the paraspinals all the way from C7 all the way to the lumbar spine. Um, and then I had him perform like a thread the needle exercise to get his thoracic mobility involved. Uh, and then after about five minute session, he came in the next day to work and had complete resolution of his pain. And then patient D was a 19 year old male who played baseball recreationally. His primary worry was pain with throwing, um, especially in his posterior shoulder. Uh, the main phase that he had pain was from the acceleration to the deceleration stage of throwing. So on evaluation, he demonstrated weak lower and middle trap um, on manual muscle testing and poor dynamic activation of his force couples with elevation, uh, which was seen with the pre premature upward rotation. The primary treatment plan was to strengthen his scapular stabilizers and neuromuscular re-education of the muscle activation with movement, eventually transitioning over to an overhead throwing position. After six visits, uh, he reported that he could throw about 80% before he started to get his pain. So I cupped his posterior cuff uh, statically and dynamically. So I had him perform dynamic external rotation with the cup on. And then I had him pitch again at 80%. He had no pain following that first cupping session. Um, and then I had him pitch at 100% and he had no pain. Uh, the next session he came in, which was about a week later, he had no pain for a week with 100% throwing. So these are just a few examples of my experiences with cupping in the clinic. Uh, and then patient education that you need to explain to your patient prior to treatment is the bruising and bruising and the marks that may last between one to 10 days. Um, we also want to tell them that it will be uncomfortable initially, but eventually it will feel better. Um, another adverse effect that you need to make them aware of and you need to be aware of is lightheadedness and dizziness. Um, you also want to get you don't want to guarantee success because this modality may not work all the time and it may not work on any everyone. So just as anything else, it has a time and place. However, the benefit to risk ratio is usually high. Um, I also recommend trying this on yourself to be more confident in its use, as well as to explain to the patient what to expect. And lastly, in summary, I just want to review everything that we kind of talked about. So the mechanism action is not well understood in the research. However, there is clinical application for this. It's pretty easy to use and it's very low cost. Um, there's no protocols or parameters that's fully supported. In the literature, however, it has been studied, so you can find articles regarding that. Um, it's found to be effective for pain reduction. It increases blood flow and its uh, soft tissue restrictions. It's also another tool in the toolbox. The setup time and treatment time is minimal for the effects that it may occur. This may not work on everyone, but if you find the right patient, it's worth a try. So I just want to thank everyone, um, and I will pass it on to Isabella. All right, thank you, Jess. Um, I will be taking over the second half of this uh, Grand Rounds presentation to speak about the clinical management of the dancer. 
Um, so we recently have formed a Performing Arts Medicine Institute, also going to be referred to as PME here at St. Luke's. So if you find a dancer on your schedule, um, the purpose of this lecture is to give you some key concepts for clinical management to help you best serve them. If you find yourself in over your head, you have many peers at St. Luke's who will be happy to discuss your patient with you and support you in providing the best care possible. If this is a population you are interested in and want to prioritize, please let me or Emily Horniak, DAT, and the athletic trainer for the Lehigh Valley Charter High School for the Arts know, and we can help get you on the list for preferred providers for performing artists. Our emails will be on the last slide. The demands of dance include but are not um, limited to familiar concepts, including aerobic and anaerobic energy utilization, muscular strength, endurance, speed, balance, coordination, agility, flexibility, and motor control allied with the aesthetics of the discipline of dance they are working within. However, dancers often extend their bodies beyond the norms of conventional sport, including extreme ranges of motion, unnatural positions and biomechanics, high proprioceptive and neuromotor control, repetitive training, and perfectionism. Dancers as a population have increased risk of injury by exceeding the limits of their anatomical and physiological capabilities with repetitive training, and they often start training from a very young age, which can ha have a significant impact on future health. We overwhelmingly see injury to the lower extremity, specifically the foot and ankle, being the most commonly injured site, and this is a uh, consistent across dance disciplines. Other frequent injury regions include the knee and lower back. The lifetime incidence for injury for a dancer is 90% and the annual incidence is 72%. These stats are alarmingly high and it is likely a dancer will end up in the medical system. Dancers tend to be skeptical of the medical system and will often try to self rehab before reaching out to a professional due to reports of poor previous experiences. It is important to keep this in mind when they do make it into the clinic and try to keep the experience as positive as possible. This includes only pulling from dance if absolutely necessary and compromising with the dancer to maintain buy-in. Much like long distance runners, as soon as you pull them from their activity, you oftentimes lose them. Mechanism of injury and injury type can vary by discipline that they are training in. For example, ballet and modern dancers are more prone to overuse injuries, while hip hop and break dancing are more prone to acute injuries. However, both populations are at an increased risk due to the nature of the training. Some common overuse injuries that we see are a snapping hip. The nature of this condition is an overuse injury with a high occurrence in activities that rep re involve repetitive hip flexion and extension. Tendinosis in general in a variety of locations is highly common due to the repetitive natures of the activity. Most common areas include patellar tendinosis and Achilles tendinosis in addition to the snapping hip syndrome, which can sometimes be classified as a tendinosis as well. Acute injuries often occur due to collisions or non-contact falls. ACL and ankle injuries are most prevalent due to the nature of the sport, including jumping and cutting motions. Strains vary a bit from the mechanism of injury we typically think with sports medicine. They often occur of slow stretching types of injuries or improper warm up prior to a large range of motion, and the location is most likely to be in the proximal hamstring. The discipline in which the dancer trains in will tell you a lot about what is required of the dancer's body in order for them to meet aesthetics and movements of that style. Ask the dancer to show you videos if it's a style you are not familiar with. I am trained in more Eurocentric styles such as ballet and modern, so sometimes I have to ask my Latin ballroom dancers or hip hop dancers to show me videos of their style so I know what the requirements of their discipline are. They are appreciative of you asking and it shows that you care about them getting back to doing what they love. With this, if they are studying ballet, are they on point? This whole concept could be a lecture in itself, but know that standing on your toes for hours will alter the biomechanical demands on the body. And here on the screen, you just see a variety of different styles of dance and the diversity within the sport. In the evaluation of the dancer, it is also important to understand the intensity of their training schedules. For kids, there is no rule like there is with baseball and pitch counts. Some kids are dancing two to four hours after school and grade school from once a day to six days a week. Well, some high schoolers will opt to do vocational programs where they dance half of the school day, then return to their studios in the evening for multiple hours. It is not uncommon for pre-professional or very serious recreational dancers to exceed 30 hours a week dancing, while professional dancers can easily exceed 60. Knowing intensity can help with your recommendations to pause from class or reduce the hours in the studio. 
Are they in technique class, which typically consists of a demonstration of an exercise, execution of the exercise, rinse and repeat, and usually ending with a longer combination? Or is it a rehearsal where dancers are practicing for a performance, but are also prone to sitting for long durations when they're not needed? Are they performing? Consider the flooring which they typically rehearse on. Sprung floors are the gold standard and have been suggested to reduce frequency of impact injuries. Have caution loading quickly on hard floors such as concrete or wood, and consider dancing in sneakers if permissible to help with repeated impact in early returning stages. Also be sure to ask about any upcoming performances or competitions. Much like seasonal sports, performances and competitions are similar to playoffs for dancers. They need to be at their prime, and, but oftentimes it's at the end of a very taxing rehearsal season and they are fatigued and will want to dance through any issues since the performance must go on. Much like a football player wanting to get it good enough to play states, then he'll take some time off to heal the injury. Do not be surprised if you hear a similar sentiment from dancers. Also, with the evaluation of the dancer, it's important to keep in mind that anyone can identify as a dancer, even if they're not spending all their free time on the studio or on the stage. Some other things to keep in mind with the evaluation of the dancer include mental health and hypermobility. Anxiety and depression are common yellow flags and dancers tend to have higher levels of anxiety and depression than the general population. In one study, 60% of dancers met criteria for psychological health. Dancers also tend to dance through physical pain, which can trigger emotional pain. Physical pain in dancers can result in feelings of loss, shame, crisis, guilt, anxiety. Considering the psychological impact that injury has on dancers, physical and psychological practitioners should be encouraged to work collaboratively to provide a holistic approach to injury management, making sure to identify those who may be struggling mentally but are not actively seeking psychological support. Psychological tools such as goal setting and imagery can also be integrated into physical rehabilitation. Dancers are classified as flexibility athletes alongside gymnasts, figure skaters, and cheerleaders, and there's a natural element of natural selection towards those who have larger ranges of motion. Every dancer should be screened for hypermobility since it's highly prevalent in the population. The bite-in score is a quick, validated measure to determine if they have global hypermobility. This can impact your plan of care and education to help heal from the injury that you are encountering them for, but also to assist in future injury prevention. Other things to keep in mind are relative energy deficiency and pelvic floor health. Dancers are at a high risk for relative energy deficiency, or RED, due to the prevalence of disordered eating and eating disorders, low energy intake and low body mass, aesthetics concerns, low sun exposure from training indoors for extended hours, and a general lack of education. Ask your dancers with uteruses the date of their first menstrual cycle, the date of their most recent menstrual cycle, and if it's regular. If you are suspicious, inquire about energy intake. Be wary of repeated injuries, especially ones that could indicate poor bone mass, such as recurrent or frequent stress fractures. If you are concerned, refer them to their primary care for blood tests and a DEXA scan. It is not uncommon for these individuals to be diagnosed as, with osteopenia as young as 30 years old, so we want to catch it as quickly as possible. Early detection of RED is the best outcome for these individuals, especially if they are teens and young adults. Dancers are also prone to pelvic floor dysfunction due to the nature of the sport, especially with the high volume of jumping and altered breathing patterns. A quick and easy list of questions that you might want to include in your exam is, do you leak with coughing, sneezing, or jumping? Do you have to rush to go to the bathroom to make it in time? Do you feel like you need to go frequently or whenever water runs or you pass a certain place? Do you have difficulty holding bowel or bladder when feeling anxious or stressed? Do you have pain with sex or inserting a tampon? Do you have uncontrolled loss of gas? Do you hesitate once in position for bowel or bladder elimination? Do you feel like you still have more urine or feces after elimination or incomplete emptying? And do you have increased feelings of heaviness in the pelvis that get worse throughout the day? Often these um, feelings or sensations is normalized, so dancers won't talk about this or realize it's an issue. They may benefit from a referral or consultation with Women's Health PT if they answer yes to any of the above questions, especially if they have hip or low back complaints, since these regions do demonstrate regional interdependence. So moving into our orthopedic comparison, the most important concept to remember when rehabbing a dancer is simple. Maintain a good neutral first before adding back in your dance technique. If you are not sure where to start assessing the high level dancer, 
a functional movement screen is a great place to start to determine asymmetries and areas of deficit in a manner that is familiar to the orthopedic clinician. It can help you develop individualized corrective exercises to be incorporated into their training and plan of care. And it's hypothesized that doing so can help reduce the risk of re-injury or new injury. Early normative value testing of the collegiate dancer demonstrate that the deep squat, hurdle step, and rotation stability assessments being the least proficiently performed skills. So that's number one, two, and five on your screen. Single leg squat can also predict leg alignment in the turned out position, which is full hip external rotation in standing. Assess the entire kinetic chain to ensure good patellar tracking, level pelvis, etc. the same way we would with any individual. Once they master it in neutral, ask them to continue in that turned out position while maintaining the efficient kinetic chain, as seen on the right hand of your screen. Carry it into more dynamic activities, such as jumping. That single leg hop is a great way to look at it, ensure they're making good alignment, or the airplane test, seen here, similar to a um, single leg deadlift. Dancers tend to test out of balance tests, such as the Y balance test. Be sure to assess your dancer without visual feedback, especially not in front of the mirror, and don't be afraid to get creative in challenging your patients for interventions, such as standing on a BOSU on one leg while moving, moving the other leg. Jumping is an integral part of most dance disciplines and involves the use of both muscular strength, strength and elasticity. Studies report that plyometric training has been shown to have a positive effect in dancers. However, there are warnings that plyometric training must be approached gradually and systemically in order to avoid injury. A good starting point is to design exercises in which dancers are encouraged to jump in that neutral position without emphasizing artistic skill, but instead simply focusing on jumping higher. Once the dancers have gained greater understanding of how to elevate themselves, they can then bring correct dance technique back into the movements while trying to maintain that newfound height. Dancers are also uniquely skilled in visualization as it's often used heavily in dance classes and rehearsals. If you have a dancer who is very low level, such as an early post-op patient, it might be a wise idea to add some motor imagery to assist with pain management, psychological benefit, and motor recruitment while staying within post-op precautions. But it can also make your session very fun for your higher level athletes. Finally, talking about a safe and productive return to sport, so there are some things to consider. First off, for loading progression, consider how much training they do. This is why we pick, we ask these questions back at the evaluation. So you can know how quickly to add it back in. This can be duration-based or repetition-based depending on the pathology. You wanna ensure that the dancers know why they are limited and that in the future they will be able to do more. Dancers do tend to push through pain and wear pain as a badge of honor. Educate them out of dancing through pain as honorable and that rather it can be extremely harmful, harmful in the long run and that yes, you will be able to do more as you go through the return to sport progression. Especially in the situations where you do have to ultimately pull them out of dance or drastically cut down on the hours a week, be clear on expectations regarding return to sport. Educate them that the medical system is there to get them back to their best performance possible and that we only pull them from dance if absolutely necessary. Also educate on the importance of dancing on good flooring if possible and wearing appropriate football footwear when flooring is less than ideal. Provide strict instruction on volume for uh, high impact elements such as jumping or point work. Similar to the same way you will gauge your miles for distance runners or pitchers for um, baseball pitchers or softball pitchers. Take rehab as an opportunity to set up an individualized warm up or cool down since these are often not incorporated into class and rehearsal. The expectation for class and rehearsal is that you show up early to prepare yourself and you should be warm and ready to go at the start time for the rehearsal or class, though many dancers skip these crucial steps in caring for their body. And finally, you want to involve teachers, parents, coaches, and let them know that the whole team, dancer, parents, and medical support are on the same page and have the same expectations. Ensure parents and teachers are aware of restrictions or limitations to assist with compliance at home and in the studio. Also, lean on your parents to ensure that your dancers are getting enough sleep and nutrition to, success, to support success in performance, as well as to help with healing. Thank you very much. And what questions do you have for me and Jess? Please feel free to either unmute yourself 
and ask or type into the chat box. So I, I have a question for uh, for you, Jess. Um, a lot of your cases that you uh, provided were after failing other instances. Mm -hmm. Are there any cases where you feel like, yeah, we got to start with cuffing immediately? Is there any is there anything in your initial examination that would indicate that you want to start there? Um, if I guess if I see a lot of muscle tightness or a lot of tension, I'll usually start there, or I'll use like instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization, or we have a Theragun at our clinic, so we might use a Theragun. Um, kind of step more away from like soft tissue stuff with my hands just to save my hands a little bit. So I try to use more modalities in that aspect and it's quicker. So three minutes versus 10 minutes saves you time and you can do more exercise and stuff afterwards too. Cool, thank you. Uh, and for you, Bella, um, what would you say is the most difficult thing about uh, working with dance medicine? <laughs> um, and I can say this because I am a dancer. Dancers are um, difficult to work with due to the perfectionism and the high levels of anxiety. Um, we can be very difficult patients because we won't want to stop. And we usually seek care well after we should have sought care. Um, so you know, a lot of the times in personal experience and as a clinician, uh, it's been like, hey, why didn't you come in three weeks ago when you first rolled your ankle? Oh, I, I was dancing on it. I thought it would get better. Um, that's a very common sentiment to hear. And I'm guilty of having said that to my PT. It sounds very similar to runners. Yes, yes, absolutely. Runners um, are a great population that um, is a little bit more common in sports medicine to compare the dancer client to as well. All right, well, if you have any other further questions, again, feel free to con uh, contact either uh, Dr. Hamadi Atia or Dr. Skankamore. And uh, thank you very much for attending. Please make sure that you sign in on EADS. Uh, the uh, link is on the invite for this program um, so that you get credit for attending. And if you're watching the recorded version, please make sure you uh, complete all the requirements to get credit for it as well. Thank you very much.